Hello and welcome to Your Coaching Journey, a podcast for doctors about coaching. Whether you are a coaching doctor, a doctor who is learning to coach, or a doctor who'd like to build coaching into your professional life, then this is the podcast for you. Hello, I'm Tom Dillon, and with me today is my co-host and business partner, Helen Leathers. How are you, Helen? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm wonderfully well, thank you very much. What are we talking about today, Tom? We're talking about coaching topics. We are talking about a coaching topic which comes up a lot, I think. In one way or another, it comes up in our coaching, and that is mindset. Mindset. Okay, so where do we start with this? I think we'll start with the work of Carol Dweck, who had the notion of the difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. So Carol Dweck uh, is a professor of psychology at Stanford University, and she primarily works in education, so looking at children and the development of children, uh, but has been working on, uh, kind of came up with the idea of a growth mindset back in 1998, so it's been around a long time. So how long is that, 25 years? Mm. Yeah, similar to the positive psychology movement, actually, mm -hmm. so they've kind of run in tandem. But her idea really was that if you have a growth mindset where you are happy to think about how you might develop and that your um, intelligence isn't fixed, that you can develop it and you can develop new skills, that's a good thing. If you have a fixed mindset that you just accept that you're either intelligent or you're not intelligent, but you just think, well, that's that's fixed. Can't do anything about it. And perhaps if you're not good at something, you just accept you're not good at something. That becomes a fixed mindset. So that was her notion that there was the difference between the two things. OK, so you're one or the other. Yeah. So in in obviously her work was primarily with students. And what she found was that though the children that had a fixed mindset would start to struggle with something, let's say maths, they would uh, go, well, I'm not good at maths. And they'd generally be told they weren't good at maths. So pretty soon that story would get around that, well, he's not good at maths. And they would just accept that. And that would become their narrative around maths. Mm -hmm. They might excel at something else, but that would become the narrative. People with a growth mindset would perhaps struggle with maths, but would be prepared to continue to work at it, to get better at it, to improve on it and would be quite happy with that. So the, that's the, the fundamental difference between the two. Mm -hmm. And obviously this is something that could carry on into, and probably does, carry on into later life as well. So mm. that starts off as, as a childhood thing, but soon develops into a, an adult way of thinking. Mm. So she had the notion that people generally have a fixed mindset or they have a growth mindset. Interesting. So people that come for coaching... Would they have a growth mindset? I, you would say, expect that because they've come for coaching that they would. Mm. And I think it, it's going to depend on what's going on for them. OK. Sounds like we need to explore that a little bit more later. Yeah. If we think about Carol Dweck and her work and, and why it came about, I think there was a general perception that people were either born smart or they're born dumb and that was the hand you'd been dealt and there was nothing much you could do about it. And there was a research study done in... America in the 1996 and of parents that were asked 90% said that they believed that their children's intelligence was fixed and there was not much that could be done about that 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 was how it would end up being in life wow so her approach was very much yeah I don't think that's right so it was challenging that and looking at whether people's ability could be developed and their intelligence could be developed or whether it was very much that case that it was just fixed and mm. there was nothing we could do about it. So I think that's, that was the origins of her research. So what she found was that children with a fixed mindset tended to um, spend their time trying not to look dumb. So they would obviously not do well in, in, in a test and would be seen as dumb, but then they would spend their time trying to fix it. So they'd find ways around it. Mm. <laughs> um, Rather I think I might trying, have met some people like think, that. Yeah, rather than trying to improve, let's say, maths, they would try try and find ways to um, appear smart. Mm. So they perhaps wouldn't push themselves to do harder tests uh, for fear of getting them wrong. But I think that applied to more intelligent children with the same fixed mindset, that even if they were good at something, if they had a fixed mindset about it, they wouldn't do harder tests just in case they lost that label of being intelligent. Mm, so a fixed mindset doesn't denote intelligence. No. 
It just denotes what you do with that. It's just your approach to learning. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And if we think about neuroscience, mm -hmm. if we think about the thinking around the brain's capacity to change, you know, 50 years ago, people just thought, well, the brain's the brain, it doesn't change much. Now we understand more about neuroplasticity. Uh -huh. and we know that whilst an awful lot of changes happen in that growth stage up until the age of 25, that's where most of the changes take place in our brain, our brain can continue to change well into our 90s yes, if we absolutely. live that long. And so, technology has advanced since Yeah, so this we have evidence started. now yeah. that the brain can change. Mm -hmm. So I think her growth mindset work coincided with that research into neuroplasticity and we have evidence for what she is proposing. So that's the background, but what do we mean by the term mindset? So mindset is a mental frame or lens that selectively encodes and organises information. So we obviously have so much information coming at us all the time, we can't possibly process it all. So we tend to categorise um, and we do the same with activities, um, pursuits. We put those into categories. So if we're struggling with something, we might well have the mindset around that particular activity that that's not something I want to spend time and energy exploring. I'm just not good at it. So we might categorise it in that way. So that might be our mindset about, let's say, swimming mm. as an example. Um, so you might have had the experience as a child of not being able to swim very well and you just then, the story says, I'm not going to pursue that anymore. And that's your mindset. That's, mm. that's a fixed mindset. So it's just the narrative that we build up around a particular topic, I think, is what we would classify as a mindset. And kind of tipping over into other theories, that's not just what we tell ourselves, but perhaps what we've heard other people talk about. Yeah, yeah, it's all around. going to yeah. be, we're a product of our environment, aren't we? So mm. if we're around people that are saying, oh God, you're rubbish at that, uh, we might well stop trying at that point. Mm. If we just feel that we're rubbish, we might stop trying at that point. Um, if we're around lots of people that are really good at something, there's so many influences that will feed into our mindset around particular activities. Mm. So okay. if we stop to explore those mindsets and do some metacognition, some thinking about thinking, then I think that's a really good way to actually explore with coaches what's going on for them and whether they're right in their thinking, whether that mindset they have about a particular endeavour is right or not. So metacognition... I think that thinking about thinking is something that we rarely stop and do. So what would be the advantage to doing that? How would that unfold in the coaching room? Well, I think we might well have someone who presents themselves as not being able to do something uh, and that they might come along and say, well, I've never been good at that. So they might, you might have someone who wants to exercise but say, well, I've never been very sporty and they've just got that narrative that they tell themselves. So 15 years ago, I believed that I wasn't good at public speaking. I very rarely did public speak. I avoided it at all costs. I was a bit scared that if I stood up on stage, someone would ask me a question that I wouldn't know the answer to and that would be really exposing. And I think that was, that was what underpinned my anxiety around public speaking. Mm. Uh, but at some point, I decided I was going to get good at public speaking. Uh, but I, d I definitely had that mindset at that point. Mm. And yet here you are doing a podcast and you've got three presentations to do this week. I have three presentations <laughs> to do this week. And I'm not particularly well prepared for them at this point in time. <laughs> so my anxiety about being on stage and being vulnerable and perhaps someone asking me a question I don't know the answer to is totally gone now. So I'm, I'm walking into this week thinking I've still got some prep to do, but it will be OK. Mm. So that's just a mindset now around public speaking that yeah. I have. Um, so if you've got someone coming into the coaching room with a similar topic, you might well start to explore what the narrative is uh, and what their mindset is about, about that thing. So let, let's explore this a little bit with you. OK. Helen. Um, so tell me something that you are particularly good at. Something I'm particularly good yes. at. Well... Oh, you know, I'm good at lots of things. <laughs> That's just my mindset. Is modesty one of those things? <laughs> I think I'm particularly good. Let's focus on yoga. Okay, so yoga. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And what is the story that you tell yourself about yoga? So 
I discovered yoga when I was about 18, so quite a long time ago now. And I have a natural aptitude towards it. I'm naturally quite flexible. I still can't do all the poses. And I have had times where I've gone for months where I haven't done any yoga at all. And when I've come back to it, I've always felt at home with it and comfortable with it. And I can I can just do it. That's not mm-hmm. to say it's without its challenges, but I, I'm... I think I'm good at it and I enjoy it. And how do you feel about the challenges? I love the challenges because it gives me something to work towards. Okay, good. And what do other people say to you about your yoga? Some people I know also do yoga and are, you know, we'll just talk about yoga and how great it is. A lot of other people will be like, oh, no, I, I couldn't do that. I'm not flexible. It's not something, and they immediately shut it down mm. because they think they're not flexible. Mm. And what I know about yoga is, although I am naturally flexible, it is not about being flexible. Mm. So it's about so much more than that. Okay. But you have that sort of affirmation from other people that you're good at yoga. Yes, yes. I've had feedback from teachers mm. saying that I have good proprioception, awareness of where my body is, good alignment, um, and that kind of thing. I, you know, even. A few weeks ago, I, someone said, you have a really strong practice. So I have that affirmation from um, teachers and from people that I talk to about yoga. And then other people kind of have, it almost gives me a positive frame because they say they can't do it. So in a way, it's almost like you're lucky you can do it. Mm. So there, there's yeah. something positively affirming about that as well. Yeah. And what do you think, you mentioned that you're naturally quite flexible, but it's not about that. So what do you think the reasons are that you are good at yoga? Um, there is that natural ability. I, I think also that I appreciate that it's not about just physicality and that it's about getting to a place where you can um, be comfortable in your body, find peace, find balance not just physical balance, but balance in your mind, connection. But also it's the willingness to not be good at it in that I can't do all the poses. There are Mm. some that I just can't get past the first stage. There are some that I get to a certain point and I just can't do the advanced elements of them. And I'm prepared not to do them in their entirety. And I think that willingness to not be perfect at it... Mm allows me to just give it a go yeah and you were saying that i can't do certain elements Mm. but it sounds like you can't do them yet yet yes i think that's an important element of having a growth mindset is the yet Mm. so working towards things that you can't do at the moment yeah so when i started playing tennis i couldn't really do a backhand side i didn't even i watched other people do it i don't know how to do that Um, But it was something I was prepared to learn and build into my game. Mm. So that's your mindset around yoga. And it sounds like you have a very well-rounded growth mindset about yoga. So let's think about something else that you're not good at. Tell me something you're not good at. Well, it's funny you should mention swimming earlier. Okay. Because swimming is not really my thing. I'm not a strong swimmer. If you catch me on a day where I'm not aware of what I'm saying you might even hear me say I can't swim okay which is actually factually incorrect but I'm not a good swimmer so what's the story you tell yourself around swimming um I can't swim I can't float um if I go in the sea I'm going to get eaten by something um yeah and I'm just not a strong swimmer okay and what do other people say to you about your swimming well it's funny because I think one of the reasons that I didn't learn to swim from a young age. You know, I think about your grandchildren and they're taken to the pool on a regular basis, even from being in nappies. That didn't happen because my mum has a fear of water and can't swim. So there's that in contribution to my belief, even though my dad's a great swimmer. Um, But also, when I was in my 20s, I decided to have swimming lessons so that I could do my paddy open water diving Mm. qualification and I had a group swimming lesson and one of the things I had to do was breaststroke and the guy just went yeah he tried a few things and then just went yeah don't do that one 
So the teacher was telling me I couldn't do mm. that particular stroke of swimming. Yeah. Uh, even though diving is more about sinking than swimming. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, but I still so had to pass the swim yeah, test. Okay. And it, it's really but interesting. You did pass the swim test. Yes, and that's what's really interesting, isn't it? I still say I'm not a good swimmer, and yet I passed the swim test mm -hmm. in order to do my paddy open yeah. water, and I can do front and back crawl. Yeah. So, what do you think the reasons are that you give yourself for not being good at swimming? Um, that I can't do breaststroke, I can't do the kick. Okay. Um, that. I struggle to flow, which is ridiculous, isn't it? It's a ridiculous thing. When I was doing my paddy, I was in a wetsuit, and so in my head, I can only float if I'm wearing a wetsuit because it gives okay. you buoyancy, right? So I say that I can't float. And I suppose it's just been confirmed by a teacher, hasn't it? Mm. Someone in authority has gone, yeah, give up on that one. Okay. So it sounds like you've got two very different narratives going on, one for yoga and one for swimming. Yes. So if you were to take the mindset that you have around yoga and your exploration of that and were to apply it to swimming, and let's say you had to write an instruction manual for someone who was learning to swim, let's say they were going to take part in a triathlon and they needed to swim in order to do that. It's not really a great passion of theirs, but they need to do it for something. What would you be telling them in that instruction manual? Well, that's really interesting because a few years ago, I decided that I might do a triathlon. OK, yeah. And I knew I could run because I'd done a half run, mm -hmm. a half marathon. I knew I could cycle because I trained my body to do mountain biking. Mm -hmm. I just knew that I couldn't swim, which, again, that is what I told myself, which is ridiculous. In a triathlon, you do front crawl. I can do front crawl. Um, so I was looking for one-to-one -one swimming lessons because my experience of a group swimming lesson was not good so I would for me if I was telling someone my first step would be find a one-to-one -one swimming coach mm -hmm. and let's say they found a one-to-one -one swimming coach and were still struggling with it and again using your growth mindset from your yoga what would you be telling them about that feeling at the beginning of not being good at it practice Practice, 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 because that is the thing that you have to do to get good at it. And we're always, when we are at the start of something, we're always learning, but also adapt. And I think that's one of the things you get from yoga is it's OK to allow ad adaptations. Now, what this swimming teacher kind of did when I had the group lesson was he was saying, yeah, don't do that. But what he was actually saying was use, do the front um, breaststroke with a front crawl kick. And I thought that was ridiculous and it felt really uncomfortable and I, I just sank um, in my head. So he was talking about adaptations and in my head I've translated that as don't, you know, don't just don't do breaststroke. Mm. So I think get a one-to-one -one, um, tutor, practice, 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 be prepared to be bad and be prepared to adapt. Yeah. Good. Excellent. So that, so it sounds as though you could take your... I yoga. could. Now, going back to what I was saying. I just never really bothered. <laughs> yes. It's like that uh, Tony Hancock quote from The Blood Donor, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, you adopt then. No, not really. I never really bothered. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I think that's part of that mindset thing. I, I talked about the mindset being that almost categorization of different things. It's okay to have a mindset of, well, I'm not going to bother with that. It's not important enough. So I would love to be able to play the piano. I want to have learnt to play the piano at some point in the past. I don't want to go through the effort of learning to play the piano. It's going to take a long time. I know it's going to be hard and, and I just don't want to do it. But I would love to be able to play the piano. So I'm mm. just not prepared to invest the time and energy. There's other things going on, my, on in my life that are more important than playing the piano. So I think there is an element to that. So if we think about the growth mindset, fixed mindset, you've already demonstrated that you have both. So mm. you have a growth mindset when it comes to yoga you and most a, things and you have a fixed mindset when it comes to swimming it's almost like you've cut that off go, that, okay that's out the window and that doesn't really matter it's not going to impact a bit at all on your life is it no unless you have to go swimming but so i think there is that element that and this is what's interesting about carol dweck's work is that she almost says okay you either have a growth mindset or you have a fixed mindset and if you have a fixed mindset you could learn to have a growth mindset but you've probably got a fixed mindset that's who you are which sounds a bit fixed in her mindset about mm. fixed mindset. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? It's <laughs> which, a bit limiting. Yeah, which is interesting because on the cover of her book, she wrote a book called Mindset, and it says 
it's something about reaching your potential, um, how to reach your potential. And I thought, well, that's a bit of a strange thing to say for something about a growth mindset, because surely your potential is ever expanding. Mm. So once you've got there, what do you do then? If you've reached your potential, do you just stop? Does your mindset become fixed? Yeah. Interesting. I've reached my potential. Done. Um, so, <laughs> so I digress. Uh, I think, uh, yes. So I don't think that people either have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. I think it depends on the circumstances. So you might have a child who has a fixed mindset about maths. Mm. But actually, when they're gaming, they will have different levels that they're trying to get to. They will keep working at it to get to the different levels. So they'll definitely have a, a growth mindset about gaming. They might never think about it. They're not doing that metacognition. Mm. They're not thinking about their thinking. But they will definitely be working towards getting better at gaming. Mm. Every gamer wants to be better at gaming. Yeah. So that, and they will have a growth mindset about it without thinking about it. So I think, for me, that's been my sort of takeaway of exploring the idea of a growth mindset is that it's it's subjective it's individual most people aren't one or the other um i think you do come across certain individuals that seem very shut down in their thinking about all sorts of different things and it might have become a bit of a pattern of thinking but i, I think it would be very unusual to have someone that was totally fixed in their mindset about everything absolutely and i think that if if you have that type of person, it's unlikely that you'd get them in the coaching room. Yeah. And yeah. I love that idea of, and it's something I've used before, of taking a skill that you've used elsewhere and how do you apply it to this situation? And I think that's a really great coaching technique. Yeah. So as we've just explored with yourself, taking your yoga experience and applying that to swimming, if you really wanted to swim, <laughs> yes, you could. So I think there is that element. I think... Also, we can, what I notice in the coaching room is people develop a mindset of it's too late mm. because I didn't do it when I was younger. It's now too late. I couldn't possibly do it now. And I think that can become a thing. I had a lovely experience with a, a lady who was an academic who wanted to be a professor and she was an associate professor, but there were a couple of levels to get to. She, she needed to become a reader before she became a professor. And she just kept saying in the coaching room, I've just left it too late. She'd had children and taken a career break. She said, I've just left it too late. I've got all these obstacles in my way. I've just left it too late. So that was her mindset about mm. being a professor. Um, and we explored that. And I said, so what, what would you need to do in order to become a professor? And she said, well, I'd have to become a reader. And I said, and what would you need to do to become a reader? And she said, I'd have, I have to write a paper that was approved. And I said, and how capable are you of writing a paper? And she said, yeah, I could do that. Mm. And suddenly all that fell away all the leaving it too late fell away and she wrote a paper she's now a reader um interestingly her father had got to that level of being a reader so that was obviously something on her list to get to the place he'd got to so but it was just about taking away that uh, we talk about limiting beliefs when we looked at the cognitive behavioral approach and i think it's the same thing taking away that mindset of i've left it too late mm. i can't do that because i've left it too late absolutely so there's something that we need to build in when we're talking about mindset and trying to break down that fixed mindset of self-efficacy and taking those small steps that are going to allow you to reach the place you want to get to. So can you take that first step? Mm. That's all you need to do. Yeah. Because then you're no longer, I can't do that. It's, I can't do that yet. But if I carry on doing all the right things, then eventually I'll be able to do it. I'm thinking I might find a swimming coach. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. <laughs> But so I, I think that's interesting. I think one of the other things that we, it's good to do when we're coaching around uh, this sort of thing is to focus on verbs. Uh, not that we want people to be particularly good at grammar, but I think if we talk about who people are and their identity, that can become problematic. That's where the fixed minds, I'm not, I, I'm rubbish. Mm. That becomes a thing. Whereas if we talk about what actions they can take, Okay, how could you do this? And mm. What steps could you take? Then I think we can start to explore it. And if you think about your swimming, if we were to ask you on a scale of one to ten, where one is I can't swim and ten is I'm an excellent swimmer, where would you put yourself on that scale? What would you say? Well, do you know, it'd probably be about six. Okay, so so that mindset of I can't swim is not it's not real, is it? It's just no. It is a mindset. 
Yeah, I mean, I can't float, but, you know, I can definitely swim. (laughs) Maybe some work around floating. Yeah. So I think my takeaway from this is that we will all have a fixed mindset about some things and we'll all have a growth mindset about other things, even if we're not thinking in those terms. But what the evidence from the research has shown is that if we teach people about growth mindset and fixed mindset and just have that exploration of it in the way that we've done, people will become aware that Mm. it is just a mindset, that it doesn't have to be that way. And then awareness can move perhaps into changing that. Yeah, taking some action. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So the last thing I just want to mention about growth mindset is imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people that have imposter syndrome, it's that perhaps coming into a new role and feeling a bit like an imposter and wanting to be better, but they're not there yet. And Mm -hmm. I think it's that yet, that word yet is really powerful when we think about mindset. Mm. Oh, I can't do that. Oh, you can't do it yet. Mm. But actually, what are the steps that you need to take in order to be able to do that well? So I think if we can work with coaches in that sense, I think we're going to do good work. Fabulous. I have really enjoyed this conversation. Good. And I'd I say I, I like the idea of a, a of growth mindset. And I think, as we've said before, it fits into the thinking around neuroplasticity. So all the evidence is there that we can change and we can do things that we perhaps limit ourselves around. So I think it's a really useful subject to talk about with our coaches. Mm. Great. Thank you so much, Tom. And uh, You're very welcome. next time on our podcast, we will be exploring challenging in the coaching room. Yes, another one of our challenging coaching topics. We're actually going to be exploring challenging, challenging. the coachee in yes. the coaching room. So we'll see you next time. See Bye you next for time. now. Bye bye. This has been a Monkey Pants Productions podcast.